Greetings and felicitations. Hip, hip, hurrah, tally ho. Hey, baby doll. Hey, Putin. Or let's talk about another James Bond classic, The Man with the Golden Gun. Directed by Guy Hamilton, produced by Harry Saltzman, Albert R. Broccoli, based on The Man with the Golden Gun by Ian Fleming, starring Roger Moore as 007, Christopher Lee, and Brick Eklund. Music by John Barry, Eon Productions, distributed by United Artists. The London premiere was December 19, 1974. Ran 125 minutes. The budget was $7 million. The box office took in a whopping $97.6 million, but believe it or not, they were even talking about making this the last James Bond movie because they didn't feel it was as successful as it should have been. So how much did they want to make? Yeah, this was a curious one. Um, I like the movie. I like the movie a lot. I love Roger Moore. I think he's fantastic. And reading more about him and his life, behind the scenes and how he treated people and his sense of humor i just find him even more endearing as a james bond he was a true gentleman in real life and i think roger moore was an excellent james bond let's talk about the title sequence anytime you have half naked women i'm always gonna like it this one in particular one of the nude models had her pubic hair was sticking up when it needed to be flat and so the title designer maurice binder he had to do something about it the model actually gave binder a brush told him to fix the hair how he needed to he smeared her pubic hair with vaseline patted it down roger moore was there to watch it (laughs) (laughs) and he went over to saltzman and said hey if you're the producer of this film you should be getting these perks (laughs) oh yeah well (laughs) What a great guy. That's just so funny to just be standing there watching all this like, what? <laughs> I thought usually they, they do that kind of thing on a closed set where they only have, I know, you know. <laughs> I know. Or you think the girl, like, I can figure this out, but whatever. But isn't this where they put the words over? Yes. Y- yeah, that's yeah, what they yeah. wound up doing because they couldn't really get it to be completely smooth. Mm-hmm. Um, theme song. What would you think about it? I loved it. it this I one think was... it fit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was it was great with this movie, and and we always like those kind of like the the bumping type of songs, but also kind of erotic yeah. and Lulu. It was great. I didn't know anything about this artist before or after. This is the only song I know of hers, but I think it fit the theme. I think it fit the lyrically. It fit. Not all James Bond movies fit lyrically. Uh, this one did. It worked for me. What do you think about the casting of Christopher Lee as? Francisco Scaramanga, the latest James Bond villain. He was an awesome villain. I mean, Christopher Lee, you know, is such a good actor. And Everything he's, done so he's much in. Stuff. Yes, it's yes. Fantastic. He's iconic. So it's great that he got to do a Bond. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that his character is tied into a unique gadget that's not a Bond gadget. Like taking a cigarette lighter and a pen, you take these different things, put them all together, and it creates a gun, but it's gold. I mean, that in itself is cool. That was a nice little visual, too. And, yeah, all the the golden guns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, something else that, that made the movie. And Tattoo made an appearance in this movie. I always just knew him as Tattoo. I did, too. And, of course, I mean, yeah, because I had already seen Fantasy Island before I saw this movie Me for too. the first time. Sure. So, so, yeah, it was like, oh, look, it's Tattoo. I, I mean, he's so recognizable. Mm-hmm. And he did a great job in this movie. He was Hervé Villachaise. That's right. Yes. Yeah. At this time, he was very poor. He was unknown at this time. Yeah. He was living out of his car. I mean, anytime I hear something like that, I always feel terribly bad. Yeah. Can you imagine that? But uh, this this was a huge boost to his popularity. It seems like there are more jobs for midgets now. And and there were back then. It seems like that it was a very niche type of mm-hmm. Of a, of a part, and mm-hmm. so a lot of the same actors played these parts over and over, so it's amazing that that he got it as an unknown, because there were more, like the people who had been in Wizard of Oz, those actors were still around at this time. That's true, yes. I mean, the plot of the movie, this is an assassin that gets charged one million dollars a shot. We, we're we able to understand this just by the title song. James Bond is the world's 
you know, most known spy. And we're seeing in the pre-credit action sequence that Francisco Scaramanga had a bullet with his name on it. A million bullet, dollars. The, was it, it's a bullet that said 007. That's right, yes. Right. So yes. that was going to be his hit. James Bond wants to recover sensitive solar cell technology that is being sold to the highest bidder. So we're seeing multiple levels of intrigue early on with, with the plot and how things were going to unfold. And, and the fact that James Bond was already, like he was famous in, in the world of spies. Which I always found odd, even as a little kid. How like, can a if spy you're a be spy, well known? How does everybody know who you are? Yeah, that's another. That's a, one of the things where you just have to suspend belief for these movies. <laughs> yeah. Like I, as the viewer, I'm like ten years old. And I'm saying, "Well, I know who you are because you're James Bond. How does everyone know who you are? <laughs> you're not very good at being spying if you're recognizable." Uh, lots of curiosities during the filming of this movie. It was filmed in different locations, such as Thailand, Hong Kong, Macau. Part of the film set in Beirut and Lebanon, but those scenes weren't shot there. But it was interesting, when he was in Thailand, Roger Moore made the mistake of opening his eyes underwater, and he actually saw some dead bodies. That's where they were throwing, in, like in real life, not in the movies. Like in real life, they were just throwing dead bodies in the water. They don't always bury everyone. And, man, it's, I can't imagine that. That's really strange. Yeah, it must have been... A custom back then, and it's something that's weird to us. And also, he stumbled upon a cave with a bunch of bats in there, and he was excited. He ended up pulling Christopher Lee in to show them, and he said, Now, here you are, Master, because Christopher Lee was Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting also that Christopher Lee was building up this repertoire of having these unique villainous roles. You gotta figure in Dracula and Man with the Golden Gun, within time, he would be Saruman in Lord of the Rings movies. I mean, this guy is a legend in sci fi, horror, fantasy. He's, he's been doing this for decades and been doing an incredible job of it. Now, there are some scenes that, uh, again, this endears me more to Roger Moore that Roger Moore had a difficult time filming some scenes. For example, director Guy Hamilton wanted to make James Bond more tough, and which, which was basing it more on the book because Ian Fleming's character was, was tough. And so he wanted Roger Moore to twist the arm of Andrea Anders behind her back and threaten to break it. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to be more suave and use verbal language to to entice her to speak and so he didn't like doing that he also didn't like pushing a boy into the water during the boat chase like it's so curious that roger moore just just felt awkward filming some scenes like that that is interesting and I can see because why. He's, well i mean yeah. yeah because he's just playing a character so yeah. his character could might could do those things yeah but he as a person had a problem with it in fact, we were talking about Christopher Leeds, Man with the Golden Gun. He was promoting the movie on The Tonight Show, and he actually got the Golden Gun confiscated by customs when he came into the United States. Oh, they thought it was a real gun? Weird, huh? <laughs> uh, what would you think about the chase scene with the corkscrew? We know that in the 70s, I remember like Evil Knievel being all the rage. Stunt cars were a big thing. I remember even having some toys like Demolition Derby. But having that corkscrew stunt was a first for James Bond. It was another great action scene like, like they do in these movies. And, and that one was different. And, and the funny thing is the fact that Roger Moore James Bond films were unfortunately viewed as so much goofiness and silliness into it. One of the things that made this scene silly now especially is that slide whistle during it. And, and John Barry admits that he shouldn't have put that in there because it just made the scene not come across as super action-packed, but kind of goofy. Another part of the the campiness of this movie, which the, it was kind of already known for that, but yeah, that was probably a little too much camp. Mm-hmm. The island that was used for location filming for Scaramanga's Beach House, it's in Thailand, and it's known as James Bond Island to well, this yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, it is now. And even though Roger Moore and 
Christopher Lee, or I should say Sir Roger Moore and Sir Christopher Lee, uh, were enemies in this movie. Even before they filmed, they were friends in their professional acting careers. I think that's always kind of neat when you find out that the actors are friends in real life. It is neat. And and also, but I think it, it, it does help the acting because it means that they already have a chemistry together. Yes. And, and yes. even if they're, well, you know, they're not playing friends in the movie, but even if they're enemies, if they have that good chemistry, it does make the, um, the acting more believable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Christopher Lee did not have a tan in this movie. Instead, he wore full body makeup. Which makes you wonder, like, why didn't he just do a tanning bed or something? (laughs) Well, why was it an issue? I mean, he he looked fine the way he was anyway. Mm -hmm. The role of Scaramanga was offered to Jack Palance at first. I think that would work, too. I would like to see Jack Palance as a James Bond villain. That's a total missed opportunity. So I think everything that Jack Palance does just has the, he has that evil conniving way about his voice. Yeah, his voice and, and even just his, his looks. He, he mm-hmm. has the look of a villain. He could have, he could have done that. I, but either way, I would have been happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was good with Christopher Lee. Yeah. And Christopher Lee, even years later said Francisco Scaramanga was one of his favorite roles. All right. Let's talk about this. We, we always say that James Bond villains have something unique about them. Yes. Scaramanga had the man with, he was the man with the golden gun. But what's up with the nipple? Yeah, that was strange. But it's, yeah, it, it must have been like, like, because they just needed a way for him to be recognized. Mm-hmm. No one knew what he looked like. So that way James Bond could pretend to be him by showing a third nipple mm-hmm. that was a fake. But, but yeah, that's, I, I guess that's the only purpose of it though, was just to, because no one knew what he looked like and it was just a way for someone to pretend to be him. That's it. That's it. I, I got a kick out of that. And what did you think about the martial arts scenes in the movie? Remember, this was the early 70s. I thought it was great with the with the two teenage girls. That was awesome. Are you <laughs> kidding me? But that was all the rage of the early 70s were these martial art films. Bruce Lee was on an all-time high. Pardon the James Bond pun there, but it's you got to figure. Um, Chuck Norris, they had to add these scenes in to make it relevant to the times. And this is, again, not the first time we're going to see James Bond movies do something like this. They needed to make sure that current audiences wanted to see something that they were familiar with that was trending during that time. So I love the martial arts scene. And having like, you know, 50 of the bad guys against two people (laughs) and and they actually defeated them. Yeah, it's (laughs) the cliche of that type of movie. Yeah, great movie. We both loved watching it. Hey, let's get some more details, especially about the original book by Ian Fleming. We're going to turn the microphone over to Matthew Sherman of Bond Fan Events. Hello, StarPod Log fans. This is Matt Sherman of BondFanEvents.com and the James Bond Fan Events YouTube channel, leading James Bond fan conventions for over 20 years. Our next two novels that became James Bond movies were savaged by the critics, and I'll tell you why today. The Man with the Golden Gun was Ian Fleming's final novel. Posthumously, some postulate that it was finished by famous author Kingsley Amos, who wrote the James Bond dossier, but the truth is Kingsley Amos only contributed a few words to the final manuscript after a quick read and pass. Ian Fleming wrote this novel, and I can tell you why a lot of fans place it low on their list. One reason is the villain is not a giant megalomaniac like Goldfinger. He's almost more of a henchman. However, I posit that Fleming was closing the circle, knowing he was near the end of his life, that he began with Casino Royale. So in a sense, the chief is Scaramanga, the villain of The Man with the Golden Gun. And Scaramanga is the chief. As a matter of fact, I presented an academic paper on this last year, where I investigated the text and, I believe, proved my case. But Man with the Golden Gun is one of my favorite James Bond novels. Even though Francisco, Paco, Pistol, Scaramanga is a cog in a larger Soviet machine. Because it's an exciting novel. It's about a duel. And Felix Leiter gets involved, so technically you can call it a truel. Now, you have to read the novel to find out more. But James Bond is sent by M to take out Scaramanga. 
And Scaramanga, or Scaramanga, who is named after, in real life, one of Ian Fleming's associates with that last name, is the world's fastest draw. He can kill any man with a single shot. He's the fastest gun in the West and the East. It's a suicide mission for Bond, especially since Bond refuses to shoot Scaramanga in the back of the head. As we see in the Daniel Craig films where Bond is potentially conflicted, or at least other people bring out that he's conflicted because he's an assassin. In The Man with the Golden Gun, James Bond is an assassin who doesn't want to kill his target in cold blood. So he spends the novel trying to pick a fight with Scaramanga after taking six weeks to find him, and almost by chance. It wouldn't be British to think about anything but Ticking off the world's fastest gun, a suicide mission. It's an exciting novel, and you read it with that context that Bond is acting ridiculous for the character of Bond to draw that fight with Scaramanga. It becomes a very exciting novel. And there's also subtext to it, hypnosis, Manchurian candidates, people primed to kill. Biggest news story of the time was, of course, Kennedy and his assassination by Lee Harvey Oswald, and Ian Fleming is drawing on that even warning people that the secret agencies of the world are priming Manchurian candidates. Fascinating. Bond is very different in the Man with the Golden Gun novel from the other novels. He's always different. He's not a cartoon character. Ian Fleming would take one quirk of personality or one character trait per novel and draw it out. And in the Man with the Golden Gun, Bond is so different from the other novels, he's as different as a tomato is from a steak or an elephant. And the movie is just as exciting. One more interesting point, though, before we go on. Bond is going to convalesce at the end of the novel at his ally Mary Goodnight's place. She comes on to Bond and invites her to her home, which is located near where Strangways and his secretary were buried in the lake in Jamaica, and near the Liguania Club, which is featured in both the book and film of Dr. No. It opens Dr. No. It's where Strangways is playing cards. Indeed, Mary Goodnight says, stay at my place. You can scoot down to the Liguania Club in the afternoons, get a little exercise as you're convalescing from your wounds. And Bond thinks a little bit differently. As Fleming put it, James Bond, in the full possession of his senses, with his eyes wide open, his feet flat on the linoleum floor, stuck his head blithely between the mink-lined jaws of the trap. He said and meant it, good night, you're an angel. In other words, Bond knows the woman will try to hold on to him. And this is not long after his marriage and his wife Tracy has been killed by Blofeld and Irma Bunt. Bond knows Mary Goodnight's going to try and hold on to him. And he goes for it. And he jumps into the, quote, mink line jaws of the trap. But fascinatingly, on his second pass at the novel, shortly before his death, with his own mortality looming, Fleming went back and in his own hand on the typewritten manuscript added several more lines, and they are to close the novel at the same time he knew, deep down, that love for Mary Goodnight or for many other women was not enough for him. It would be like taking a room with a view. For James Bond, the same view would always pall. Put in other words, Bond will never, never settle down because he knows that that view will get tiresome and he's a, he's a wandering pill. He's a wandering rolling stone that gathers no moss. He will not settle down with Mary Goodnight. He will go on and be Bond. Bond knows women better now in his own Bondian mind and already plans to both pleasure Goodnight and leave her alone. Man of the Golden Gun is a really incredible novel. All the inflowing novels, and you've heard that from me before, Star Podlog fans, are underrated. The bond of the movies tends to be a little bit more one-dimensional, tends to rush through things. He doesn't have time to eat the food he orders, for example, most of the time because somebody's shooting at him or someone's trying to blow him up and so on. And when you read the Fleming novels, you get so much more. And uh, Fleming was probably the greatest novelist of the last century and certainly one of the best-selling, and those two actually coincide. Let's talk about the movie. It's a very different bond from the other novels and the books, as we've said. Different as a tomato is from steak yet again. But the movie opens up with a bad guy, a henchman that we recognize from Diamonds Are Forever, played by a famous New York actor, in Scaramanga's fun house, his carnival, hired by Hervé Villachez as Knickknack, Scaramanga's diminutive major domo and, and uh, all-around factotum, to kill Scaramanga. That's right, Knickknack, Scaramanga's henchman, 
or Scaramanga's henchman, if you will, hires a man to kill his boss. And if he kills his boss, all this will be mine, as he says. He will inherit the man with the golden gun's private Asian island, his hideaway that is patronized by Red China. And he uses people to warm up Scaramanga as an assassin the same way that Cato's character would warm up Peter Sellers, Inspector Gluzo, in the famous Pink Panther films. And so there's a lunatic go, give and go in, in a fun house. Scaramanga, of course, doesn't, doesn't die in the first five minutes of the movie, kills the henchman. And surrealistically, if you've never seen the film, he shoots off James Bond's fingers, actually off James Bond's hand, turns out to be a mannequin of Roger Moore. There's foreshadowing for the climax of the film. Pretty interesting stuff. You know you're on a wild ride. Man with the Golden Gun is not a fan favorite film by and large. In other words, it ranks down towards the bottom of most fans' lists. But the uh, locations are exotic. The side characters are exotic. Uh, people, friends of mine, chuckle when they hear my impression of high fat. This is my home! And, and so on. Be because these characters are larger than life. Sometimes the characters in the Bond films are stereotypical or they seem dated today, but in actuality, they're just larger than life. Remember, Bond's world, Fleming's world, is supposed to be actually believable. Even when an invisible car is used in Die Another Day, that was based on a real-world military development. When Elliot Carver has a stealth destroyer, stealth boat, that was based on an actual stealth destroyer, which was commissioned around the time of the, making the film. And so Bond's world is a little bit larger than life. The people are a little bit larger than life, a little bit bolder, a little bit brassier. Man with the Golden Gun has a rich color palette, very fun stunts, brings in the world of martial arts in, I think, a clever way that plays well with Roger Moore's James Bond. It's an exciting film. It's a fun film. It's a lot of laughs. It happens to be a blue film. It happens to be the film with the most and most frequent double entendres and sexual puns. And they're somewhat sophisticated. They're not as juvenile as the ones in the Pierce Brosnan films. A lot of friends say Pierce Brosnan's puns are always kind of sixth gradery. There's some pretty clever stuff. As a matter of fact, one of the favorites is when Q sees Bond's request to have a third nipple made. Now, we know Q likes to make small explosives in, in pens, at least sometimes. And Q likes to make radioactive lint so you can have some pocket lint and be traced. Very clever. And Q likes to arm Bond with the latest model arms or the most reliable arms, and so on. But in this case, Bond asks Q to make him on auxiliary papilla a third nipple, which a certain percentage of people have, a smaller third nipple on their body from their genetics. And Scaramanga, this is a denoting feature of his body in the book, in the film. Sign of sexual prowess, if you will. So Bond asks Q to make this, and Q says, rather kinky, but... So the, the humor is, is a bit sophisticated. It's very uh, blue film. It's the kind of film where I watch it and I go, wow, this is, this is heavy stuff. Uh, but of course, written to be over the heads of children. The Bond fans are meant that you can take a 10, 12-year-old and they'll enjoy the stylistic violence, the very occasional curse word, and the explosions. But a lot of the sexual stuff will be over their head and most of the sex scenes will be strictly under the covers and out of sight of the audience. So Man with the Golden Gun, a lot of fun. And of course... The marker of the film, or markers, are the man with the golden gun himself, Christopher Lee, and his golden gun. Now, Christopher Lee is nothing less than the king of all nerds and the king of all nerddom, in my opinion. Remember, Chris Lee starred as Saruman in six Tolkien Peter Jackson films. He starred as Count Dooku in two George Lucas Star Wars vehicles. And he's James Bond villain, and he was a hammer horror a fixture with over a hundred vampire and werewolf and other fun films to his credit. He was very famous Dracula. He's in the Guinness Book of Records because he and his best friend, Peter Cushing, who's also in the Star Wars series, of course, were six four and six foot five tall and the tallest leading men of their day. And Christopher Lee was also in the Guinness Records for the most sword fights on film. And uh, he said one of his greatest, if not his greatest, he even said it was his greatest. And he had a little stunt help, but not too much was his last fight as Count Dooku with Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. But Chris Lee elevates any production he's in, classy person in real life, very introverted. Uh, if you were a fan and you were attending with him, he's doing a book signing, an autograph signing, very, very quiet, very modest, but a brilliant person. Did a little bit of espionage in World War II, 
uh, his cousin was Ian Fleming, their regular golf partners, and they didn't talk about espionage on the golf course. They kept their private lives in that sense private, but they were, they were good friends and enjoyed frequent golfing outings together. And Fleming had Christopher Lee in mind, possibly for Dr. No or another role. And in the end of, the, end of it all, Chris Lee got to star opposite Roger Moore. They're both tall, good-looking uh, Englishmen who stand back to back and go face to face. And Christopher Lee, as Scaramanga, says to Bond, I only need one bullet, you have six. Which hardly seems sporting, but it's a riff on the original novel where Bond is looking to give Scaramanga a bit of a chance. And in the film's deleted scene, Scaramanga has extra bullets hidden on his person in that last duel. And we see James Bond go to the floating Macau Palace Casino to follow Maud Adams, who was the lovely who starred in both Man the Golden Gun Octopussy and did a very brief extra walk-on in The Vito Kill. She's in three Bond films at Cubby Broccoli's and Roger Moore's request in a third Bond film. But Maud Adams is the lovely Andre Anders who is giving Lazar's gold bullets secretly, covertly in the casino by having them roped up to another floor to... And, and the bullets pass from Lazar to Andre Anders as Scaramanga's cut out, the golden bullets that are used in these $1 million assassination hits. Scaramanga never misses. So they're not attempts, they're hits. And what's interesting is they're in the floating dra floating Macau Palace Casino. So it was a real-life casino. You can look up old images online. It's been since demolished, decommissioned as a boat. But off the shore of Macau, off the docks, you would board a floating vessel. She stood at anchor, and you would and you'd game there. You'd play gambling games. And this is homaged in Skyfall, of course, as the Floating Dragon Casino that Silva is intimately wrapped up in. He has his henchmen there and his mall there, and Severine pursues Bond there and lures Bond there. And the Floating Dragon Casino is an homage to Man with a Golden Gun because Skyfall 2012 is the 50th anniversary Bond film, and just like Die Another Day 2002, 40th anniversary Bond film for Dr. No, 1962, deliberately homaging past films. You can find echoes and direct, very literal homages to all the prior Bond films in Die Another Day, certainly in Skyfall as well. For example, while in the Floating Dragon Casino, for Man with a Golden Gun, if you will, Bond has a Komodo dragon fight, and, and he has to step on the back of a Komodo dragon. Clear, obvious homage to Live and Let Die, which we've discussed on the prior podcast, where Bond runs across the backs of alligators and crocodiles to escape in Jamaica. I'll be taking the fans to Jamaica to see these locations. Just yesterday, I was wondering how I could get in more Fleming locations, and I was excited. I realized I can get in three more Fleming locations in our week in Jamaica next year at Bond Fan Events, even though we're already seeing dozens of Ian Fleming locations, um, related locations, and tons of locations from Dr. No, Live and Let Die, No Time to Die. We're staying at an all-inclusive resort. As a matter of fact, we just announced about a month ago we have 10 people who already put down their deposits for beautiful suites at the San Susi Resort. You'll be staying at a resort if you join us that's in eight scenes in Dr. No and Live and Let Die, and I do tours there. We'll do a No Time to Die tour, Live and Let Die tour, Dr. No and Ian Fleming tour, and on a fourth day, we'll do a tour of the very resort we're in because I'll show you a dozen spots that were used in the film at our very own all-inclusive resort. I hope you can join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have eight or nine posted at bondfanevents.com. And I wish everyone well. I wish you would enjoy The Man with the Golden Gun. Just between you and me and everyone who's listening, it's actually one of my favorite Bond films. I don't think it's a weak Bond film at all. It's got a lot of fun to it. And just like we sometimes enjoy a serious Bond where he's in from Russia with love and he's a very serious kind of spy and he's in, he's in Quantum Assault. He's a pretty serious guy. Man with the Golden Gun's a fun movie and an enjoyable romp. And... Chris Lee was big enough to play this magnificent villain that Ian Fleming devised in Francisco Paco Pistols, Pistols Scaramanga. Till next time, Star Pod Log listeners, this is Matt Sherman signing off saying thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Please continue to follow and interact with us on both Facebook and Twitter. If you use Apple IIe, Commodore 64, or Tandy computers, Find us on your bulletin board system. Your five-star feedback is always welcome. Theme music provided by Checkpoint Charlie. Until next time, live long and may the force be with you. Nanu, nanu.